Hey, it's Tara McNamara. And it's Riley Roberts. This is 80s Movies, A Guide to What's Wrong with Your Parents. And we're here with Daniel Waters. The writer of Heathers. Thank you for joining us. Uh-oh. <laughs> so I feel indicted already. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the previous podcast we did on Heathers and still choosing to show up today. <laughs> yes, it was very interesting. I mean, I, I'd like to – it was like analyzed like the Zapruder film. It was very <laughs> – very interesting. I, I, I learned some things. Well, I, what we try to do on this podcast is look through, look at '80s movies that we love, uh, but also how they impacted teens at the time, what we can see from society now, uh, and just also what it spoke about the culture of the '80s. And I think Heather's does that really well. Well, it, there was an article recently in the New Yorker that had a great line where the woman said. It's the movie that turned the 80s into the 90s. It is, yeah. And, which I thought was a fun way to put it, like that, that we, we kind of pressed the reset button on the 80s, especially 80s teen films, which the button needed to be pressed, but it didn't dis- certainly didn't destroy teen films. But Well, what, so why did you decide, I need to write a teen film? You know, what, what was it exactly? Like, I got I to gotta write this. I have this idea, and I have to write it. Yeah, it's almost like I had the the need to write it before I had the idea. Like in that, I had, I had, I was very happy to be. I you know I dreamt of being a film critic because I love movies. I see still see too way too many movies, but you know it's like oh wouldn't it be great to write about movies like my hero Pauline Kael, and then. But then, like the movies started in this, the movies in the seventies are so amazing, and then the movies in the eighties were a little less amazing, and then. Like, oh, boy, I enjoy these teen films. I enjoy John Hughes. I enjoy Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink, a special favorite of mine. And But it's like, whoa, is this it? Is this what we're getting? Like, you know, it seems like we're missing something. Like mm-hmm. we're missing like, a, you know, not just a dark satire, but just like anything that takes it to that next level. Because, I mean, there's a classic line, and I've brought it up before in, in the Breakfast Club where he go, where they bl- they always blame the parents, always the parents' fault. Right. And like – Kids are kids are secretly all angels. Like you're, and they said your heart dies when you become an adult. And I'm like, geez, I know some people where their heart died when they were 14. Like you know that 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 this is a little off. So I thought there was a whole kind of wealth of material that could be done if I if I if 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 I did a teen. Where's this teen? Where's a teen film that like you know I always bring up the director Stanley Kubrick, my favorite director. He did the science fiction movie, 2001. He did a war movie, Dr. Strangelove. And he did the horror movie, The Shining, which was different than any other horror movie that became. Wouldn't it be great if he did a teen film? And I go, it would be great. And I go, God, I guess I'm going to have to be the one to write it because I don't see anybody else writing it. So it was almost like I just piled everything up and I took forever to write it. And. Like I had all these little slips of paper. And I call it. I still call it. It's still the way I write it. Call it collecting acorns, where you come up with a line or idea. Like a lot of people think that. Uh, How'd you come up with those lines? Well, I better. I took two years. Like you know th- mm-hmm. that. I always. I always hate movies about writers where they're sitting in a computer, fade in, and they're like, hmm, hmm. What should I write? If you don't know more at that point, then you're in trouble. But anyway, so <laughs> I just started to, you know, just vomit out this. Um, teen film and teen films. That's the way I just put it. Like even like what Dawn of the Dead was a zombie films. I wanted to be the last one. That mm-hmm. was what I was very obsessed with. So kind of, and you know, the first draft was like 250 pages. Yeah. Which is not what your first draft should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, so tell me about your life at the at the point where you sat down right like what was your life what was your immediate world what i were- i had i had graduated from school and university in montreal mcgill university and i had larry karaszewski one of my best friends who i went to high school with and he who introduced us by the way oh yes, yes he introduced he introduces everyone now he's just the man <laughs> about town but um uh he Larry moved, went to USC and he moved out of California and there was a place open. So I, so I said, okay, you know, William Goldman, who just died, he had a whole chapter in his book, forget everything I'm saying. Then if you want to be a screenwriter, you got to move to Los Angeles, whether you like it or not. So I took him on his word. We moved to LA and I couldn't get a job. Finally got a job at a video store where we played Real Genius 300 times a day. Do you have a Real Genius episode yet? <laughs> no, not oh yet. Oh, my not God, yet. you got to get on that. What's going on? Um, and 
So it was kind of like, and so it was definitely a lowly existence. And the great thing is that, like today, I feel like when a kid comes out to L.A. to be a screenwriter, they're going to have, they're going to know, they know, they know too much. Mm-hmm. Like they know what's, they've read what's hot. Oh, horror movies are selling movies. Horror movies are not selling right now. Like, oh, I'm going to do this superhero twist. Like they have a game, they have more of a game plan. I had no game plan. I just like, boy, I'd really like to see this Stanley Kubrick teen film I keep thinking about. So while I worked at the video store, do do do, just I just wrote it, and I and I try to tell people they don't believe me, but naivete it can be one of the strongest superpower there is. As far as if you, if you're not thinking about what's going to happen after you finish a script, just think about writing the script, just what the content it is. You know, write the greatest movie never made is my 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 motto. Right, but. You know, if you just think that way, don't think about what's going to happen, who you're going to get it to, what party you have to be to to get me, hand the script to somebody and become a Valley Parker and put in somebody's back back seat. <laughs> like, don't think about that. Just think about the writing, and that's and that's what I did. I just wrote this monstrosity, and if you can get one other person other than yourself to like it, you can kind of build from there. I just wanted to ask. Um... When you have all those iconic um, lines like "fuck me with a chainsaw" and like all those stuff, did you hear people saying that, or did that just pop in your head and you're like, "I gotta write that down"? Yeah, there's a. I mean, you know, part of being a writer is stealing, and not you know, not stealing from other movies. That's a little lame, but you, you do that too, of course. Um, but it is like anytime you hear anything interesting, um, you memorize it, file it, it becomes yours. Yeah, I mean, "fuck me gently with a chainsaw." That was that has a long history. Let's uh, hear it. <laughs> appar- apparently, there's a a British expression, "fuck me gently." Uh huh. And then I had a friend in Canada at McGill University, Doug Hilton, if you're listening. Um, and he used to say, and he, so he he gets he gets a lot of credit because he always used to say, "Well, fuck me gently with a crowbar." <laughs> oh gosh. And then and then so then when I came down to writing this movie, which is mostly female based, it was like. Crowbar is such a masculine word, so kind of a change to chainsaw, but mm-hmm. not not a big change. But like he would he would never have thought to put that in a piece of writing. Like you know he he just thought that was his private thing. So but I took it. My favorite one is a uh, you know I was a camp counselor in Toronto, and um, there was a girl who you know girl she was a little older. She was like eleven. She kept saying, "What's your damage?" and and it's just like, hmm. That's so good. If yeah. I do become a writer one day, I'm going to write. I'm going to take that. <laughs> and she she already overused it like she was a sitcom character. What's your damn? What did you? So so I got to think she's sitting home alone as a 40-year-old spinster. I don't know why she's a spinster. She may be married. <laughs> but, um, she's a cat lady all of a sudden. But she's like, what's your damage? That's so mine. And what's your damage is also like. It gets the one, it's the one that gets name checked on every Ryan Murphy show and on Bumblebee and like so it's like she must really be like gaslit like just mm-hmm. you know, what the hell is happening? She probably just <laughs> thought everyone was saying it or maybe she's such a trendsetter that it picked up and became its own thing. Not knowing it was that camp counselor. Oh, uh, what about mind. you're such a pillowcase? That's just it's so funny because you guys were very funny. You guys brought up like some deep cut lines and like <laughs> and like it's like. And so now, like, sometimes when I'm writing now, I'm like, oh, man, that line's not good enough. And then I remember, like, okay, you're such a pillowcase. That was just something I did come off the top of my head and just thought I was going to go back and change it. And I didn't, but it worked. It was fine. It was people liked it. The classic one is I hate the line, lick it up, baby, lick it up. (laughs) And and, and it was just like, it was just like, oh, God, that's so fucking lame. All right, but whatever. (laughs) I'll, I'll change it again. And then, like kind of what the actors brought to it and like is and suddenly like you know and then when the guys who did the musical they're like oh we're not cutting lick it up lick it up baby we, we, are you kidding me you know the audience goes crazy like yeah. so so it's just like geez so i i gotta be so it's like i gotta be less tough on myself some of my some of my losers are winners like i gotta I <laughs> give, give myself some credit here I think that's part of it. It's, I mean, part of the 80s films is they're so quotable. And so you really capped off the 80s with maybe the most quotable yeah, film yeah. that there is. Well, it's so funny because I, I get so annoyed by these screenwriting books that come out now. How to write a screenplay in 12 days and, how, and like in this, this book that drives me nuts, Saved a Cat. 
by written by a screenwriter who would stop or my mom will shoot. So he's one of the best. But, <laughs> but I feel like he's made screenwriting into a game of Mad Libs where instead of writing and not knowing where you're going, you fill out this form of like what happens here, what happens right here. And they're always saying – the dialogue should only move the story forward. Like keep it very sh- tight and short and only keep the story forward. And like sometimes it's the messy dialogue, the dialogue where you're trying to find your way with something that you come up with the best lines. So mm-hmm. I think l- people seem to ca- l- care less about dialogue now. And, you know, it's like my favorite thing. Um, part, of, part of what we um, – you know, part of what's going on right now is this sort of – why don't we have female directors making movies about women? Why don't we have female writers writing women's stories? So, of course, they weren't thinking that in the 80s at all. Um, <laughs> but but I'm, so I'm curious, why was it that you thought, I'm going to tell this, this story about Mean Girls? Don't bring up my brother's movie, Mean Girls. That's all I <laughs> He, he gets all the money. It's no fair, but it's like Mark I, Waters. I'm yeah, glad you, glad you. I mean, I always say Mean Girls is the one everybody likes. Okay, fine. It's hilarious. It's very funny, but it's just. But you were the OG, right? I was the OG. <laughs> I was the OG, and I mean, the thing is that I did do a lot of, um, you know, feminist studies in in college. I was a good feminist for that one period in the early eighties. <laughs> I'm still trying, hanging on, but you know. Did you have long hair too? <laughs> it was it was a different style back then okay. of what a, a male feminist was but it was but but writing heathers from a female point of view is never about feminism and it was always yeah. and it was always about like i just knew that you know when it comes to high school i mean men are che- men are checkers and women are chess that it is the it is the the female game. And I had a younger sister and she's very much got a lot like Veronica and she's got great stories. Like the stories between me and my brother are pretty, pretty rugged, dazed and confused, not very fa- fascinating, but like the things that she had to go through is insane. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I, you know, in, in general, in general, again, I'm not coming from a, a feminist point of view, more women's stories, but more, but I think it just makes your movie more interesting. Like, because mm-hmm. when you make it from the female point of view, it's just more, it just, it, you come at it a different way and it makes the whole thing more interesting. So it's almost like I'm a, from a mercenary point of view of like, why wouldn't you make it a, a female point of view? It just, I mean, Shakespeare's done men to death and Lady Macbeth's not that great of a character when you live deep down. So, like, <laughs> you know, like to me, women was much more a fertile ground for me. Well, then why, um, just like, why would you put uh, JD like have a guy come in and kind of make the story? You know, but 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 you guys were very astute when you talked about JD and that it was that character that like I, my thing is I like to lull people in with cliches like mm-hmm. okay oh we okay okay I get it it's going to be this movie like where the rebel comes in and saves yeah. her and like okay got it got it done. Yeah, you yeah. gotta have that romance in there too. That's yeah, and James and, Dean making it yeah, perfectly clear. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I couldn't have made it any clearer. Juvenile <laughs> yeah. delinquent, James Dean, J James D, Dean, such yeah. a great name. And then, but then, you know, and there's always, so, I always saw something psychotic about that dynamic. And like, and to for me to lull you in and think it's going to be that thing, and then turn it, turn it on its head, and then make it, you know, it's like you say the the best moment of the movie, or one of the best moments is her. You know, smoking a cigarette off the 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 flames of his burning body, like th- that. You didn't you didn't you didn't think it was going to go there. Mm-hmm. Like uh, hopefully, right? Like you know that that. Um, so it's like it, it was kind of like examining the psychosis of that dynamic, but it is entertaining that dynamic while it's going too. Like that there is that, that when you're surrounded by all these doofuses, um, turn around having nothing to offer the school but date rapes and AIDS jokes that he is going to come out as something interesting and you can enjoy that too but you got to stand on your own two feet at the end and again it's like you know I was not coming to oh sisters doing it for themselves it was more like this was just fascinating to me Mm -hmm. 
Well, I read that you said that you had sort of a journalistic point of view about high school. I mean, is that how you would dis- – is that an well, accurate well, well, I definitely had – I would definitely was the outside looking in. Like mm-hmm. I had my own common school newspaper. I always said like I was the United Nations nerd where like if if you if one click says something – says send someone to the United Nations, I'd be the geek guy. Like <laughs> I'm the king of the geeks. Like, you know, so it had a little more luster. But yeah, I always had a dete- – like – you know, you could say to my detriment that I never really felt things. Like I was like, not like, oh, I'm being traumatized. I'm being bullied. I was like, wow, this is good shit. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is, this is interesting. Like this, Cause you know, I've always said that high school is our universal experience. You know, we don't all go to war and we don't all go to Europe and we, but we all go, we all pretty much go to high school. So it's like something, it's a war experience you can all relate to. I think I think you might still be going through the trauma, right? Mm-hmm. When you're well, half a half a year out, yeah, half a year out, and I'm still traumatized by sophomore year. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heather's was, I mean, Heather's is the last movie to be a public service announcement. But I always think that that Heather's did, like I come people come up to me all the time and say Heather's is the movie that got me through high school, which I take as a compliment because I mean I think you get these you get these pat on your back themes like it gets better and like don't worry everything's going to be okay when you grow up. And then like, but I like, I like having the counter measure of like saying, Heather says, Oh no, this is awful. This is, this is terrible. And and, and you may not survive it. Like, you know, <laughs> like there's something almost comforting about having a movie tell you like, Oh no, this is the worst experience you ever go through. Like, you know, that, that okay. All right. And it's finally a movie like, and the movie's very inflated and, you know, heightened reality and all that. But High school's heightened reality, and and so it's like finally people are like okay, finally a movie's speaking to me on my on my wavelength. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, talk about what was going on at the time that you wrote the script with teen suicide and how you chose to make that you know not uh, the scapegoat, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, teens. <laughs> I mean. I'm still pissed off it still exists because I thought Heathers would cure it. Like, because yeah. everybody would like, I can't commit teen suicide now because they made such good fun of it. But like, you know, it wasn't really making fun of it, but it was making fun of the phenomenon. And that, that there was so much, you can't appreciate, I mean, you think you can go back and look at certain films. I think there was one called Permanent Record um, with Keanu Reeves. And, um, but there was so many after school specials and teen in, in, made for TV movies. There was one with Molly Ringwald called surviving, which I really, really kind of ticked me off and inspi- inspired me to start like thinking satirically, like, mm-hmm. you know, that, that that's it's when I see things that are too earnest, um, like, and it was not like, I want to make the movie that really explores teen suicide. I want to make the movie that explores bull, bullying, me and bullying. Mm-hmm. It's like, I always think that that's, to make that movie is too earnest. I want to make the movie after that movie, a movie that assumes we all know that stuff and then really fucks with your mind. Mm -hmm. But, but, but for instance, every movie had that scene of like where the, the funeral happens and like, it's such a, such a sweet victory Mm -hmm. because, because these movies create the fantasy of watching your own funeral. Like, Oh, if I commit teen suicide, this is gravy. This is going to be the best time ever. My funeral is going to be so good because everyone's going to be crying and everyone's going to say how great I am and 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 how the world is horrible and I'm not horrible and I'm a victim of the world and like I thought this is a terrible message to send like you know that like geez I'm I'm feeling pretty good today but I want to commit suicide just to get this good stuff and yeah. and so it's like that's where that's where I love my dead gay son came from is like Jesus you can practically hear him say this say that they practically you know i didn't i can't even say i invented that line because they say variations of that line in the serious versions of movies so mm-hmm. it was almost like i really wanted to expose that not you know of course i'm not saying anything about real teen depression or real teen suicide right. but just the way it is exalted is not good for anybody yeah i i You've listened to our that podcast more recently than we have <laughs> of ours, so I'm not. I think I mentioned this in that podcast, but I'm not sure um, that when I was a teenager, I I went to several different high schools, and so a girl who was in our friend group. Yeah, I know. I was saying to myself, "Why isn't she quoting 
<laughs> seven seven schools and seven taints, and the only thing different is my locker combination. The line was – it's one of my favorite lines. It's just hang it out there for you to quote, and you didn't do it. <laughs> uh, but part of the way I felt is that everyone, you know, was the, – the, right after she did kill herself and there was the shock and – Everyone suddenly was this girl's friend, and I was technically part of her friend group, but the truth was I wasn't really close to her. I didn't know her that well, and I felt really uncomfortable being, you know, the, yeah. the, the friend group got to go home early. The friend group got to – and I was like, I don't know I don't know what to do here, but seeing exactly what you put in Heather's is how there's sort of a – how other people take the death and then – somehow promote themselves. I see this by the way with True. like Twitter and social media every time somebody dies and and everyone's out there, you know, ripping it, you know, and yeah, well, and it feels almost like they're promoting themselves because oh, I knew this celebrity or I, you know, I have this connection and I'm like, I don't know, that seems is that okay? Yeah, <laughs> that no, it's weird. all it's always the anecdote involving them that like and now I'm going to be they were 95 and and we're about to die for the last 20 years, but now I can't do anything today because I'm so depressed. Like, yeah, you know, this death thing happens to everybody, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, it's funny early on when the movie was still fresh and I was going to film festivals with it, I had people whose they would come up to me like, you know, my son committed suicide. I'm like, Oh God, why did I write this movie? And then, but then they would say, wow, you got so much right. I'm mm-hmm. like, geez, I don't know if I should be comforted by like, but yeah. I, the bulimia thing, I think, is is interesting, too. That was going on big time in the 80s. I don't know if it still is. You can tell us what high schools are like. Are they? Um, at the first high school I went to, that was terrible. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. And there. middle school. I mean, it is effective. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm joking. I, I but thought by junior year, people, like, that, and, like, people are more, like, when they see someone, like, kind of hurting themselves now they'll be like hey are you anorexic are you they'll like talk to you about it yeah well i feel like everybody knows the language now there Mm -hmm. there was there was definitely not the willingness to talk about things Mm -hmm. which made my job much more funny because this was all unearthing things that hadn't been really said or talked about and then instead of like i said instead of going right to the serious version i went to the assume everyone deep down knows the serious version and i'm going to do the comic version that kind of messes with your head well i thought that's the it, best kind of version honestly <laughs> if, if there was a a slowing down of um and i i did look it up i think it, it you know about the rates of bulimia and <laughs> anorexia um because it what was interesting to me is in the 80s by them trying to stop everyone from doing it i felt like they we're in a sense promoting it. Hey, get kids, this yeah. is something you could do. Cause I know like I, you mentioned before we started that I worked in a candy store and a chocolate store, like basically every sweet fattening, delicious oh, thing geez. a teenager would like and gain 10 pounds. So I'm like, well, let's try out this bulimia thing. And then, you know, I never, I didn't have a problem with it. I was more, and I'm not, I'm actually really not good at throwing. I can't make myself throw up. I was a terrible bulimic. I mean, I was yeah. not good. Well, <laughs> neither, neither is Heather Duke. That's why she needs Veronica's finger. Exactly. Which I actually had heard from somebody too that that that, that they did that they needed assisted assisted bulimia so yeah. i'm like you know the, they make it's such a great thing for veronica because for mm-hmm. Veron- you know i like again another choice i made i didn't want to make carrie too i didn't want to make the from the point of view of the oh i'm unpopular and i'm going to get these popular girls i wanted to put her again not even making it a thing like put it you hit the ground running she's already one of the most popular kid, yeah. girls there. So it's just like, you're immediately like, wait a minute, aren't we supposed to have the scene where she becomes popular? Like, which they ended up doing for the musical and doing Mean Girls. But I liked mm-hmm. hitting the ground running. We are in this sanctum. Like, you you, you, you know, so you feel like already you're, you're, you're unprepared for like, wait, are we, are we behind, we're behind, we're behind the curtain already? Like, uh-huh. it, which it helps helps uh, dis- jar everyone, which is good, which I'd love to jar people. <laughs> well, I think well, it was you know an what? effective use of Heather Chandler and just that she says that's so 1987. And, um, and then therefore I thought put a message out to the world. Like Heather yes. Chandler is now ridiculing you if you, you know, are bulimic. So it made it 
and cool in a way. Yeah. You know, they uh, right now, instead of, well, I don't think people are bulimic anymore. I just think kids my age drink too much, and they're like, oh, no, I don't want to wait this out until I puke. So they call it pull trig. Oh, man, I love, I love that, yeah. yeah. So they just do that. Oh but God. I won't, people only do it when they're, like, drunk. <laughs> <laughs> like, this, this alcoholism is really helping my bulimia. I don't <laughs> Whatever it takes. Um, So the parents thing you brought up about how they were always blaming the parents. I, you know, on this podcast, we do talk about, right, like how how things affect society in these films that all had teenagers saying, oh, you're not to blame. It's your parents who are to blame. Do you think that this, you know, film after film of of kids in the eighties being told, Hey, it's not your fault. It's your parents' fault. It's the adult's fault. It's authority's fault. Um, do you think that helped get us to the place we are now? I mean, now we have presidents who don't accept responsibility for their actions and always blame other people. You know, um, do you, do you think that, I mean, that was like a, a slow change to get to this point, but do you think that has something to do with it? It's it's tough because now parents are much more invested in it. It's not really helping the kids. <laughs> it's like you know, that, that it's its own weird thing itself. But um, yeah, I you know it's it's hard for me to say. It's that um, what you know it was more like I was trying to like. There's a line that JD has of like, "Do you like?" Where Veronica goes, "Do you like your father?" And he goes, "I've never given the matter much thought," and like. It was more like that that we compartmentalized our parents a lot more. I thought than in movies, in than in movies back then, where it was suddenly like the parents were so involved in your growth and your thing. When when it was really like, yeah, the parents are the people you have the pate with, and like you move on, and like you tell them tell them what they need to know to make sure that like you know. I even, th- you know, I always thought getting good grades is the best scam there is. Like, if you can get good grades, you can strangle puppies, like, <laughs> after school. Like, you know, that, that it's just, it's good to feed the parents little things. And so I always thought, like, there was always a, de- there was a detachment with the parents that wasn't really explored in teen films and teen things. And, and now, like, I just know from my brother and sister, now that they have kids, like, just like, okay, it's a totally different ball game, but, but it's all, but, but I think people are now admitting that no one ever gets mature. Like, I feel like there was still ladies were the last, that there were a separation between adults and children and young people. And I feel like there's no separation now. And so when I see somebody, like when you bring up like Trump or somebody, I think he's a child. Like I, I don't, I don't. Where's, where's the adult acting badly? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's somebody who's not an adult. Mm-hmm. Like where are the adults that we can, we can criticize and like make fun of? I think maybe if, if anything, the eighties infant, 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 infantile is I to everybody. Like, <laughs> made everybody into babies, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Didn't, and you had some questions about the parents, right? Uh, about and he answered it. Oh, okay. I was going to say how they were like detached, and how there's only like three real conversations between them, and two of them are the exact. Well, but, yeah, they, they're the but same. But That's... they but they do have a real con- they do have a bit of a doozy, like you know. The, it's uh, a conversation, but it's also like a bullet points kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I I would rewrite that. I would rewrite the parents so differently now. Like I would make them. Well, it's so funny. It was still back. It was still back. And this is definitely a thing of 80s movies that went away where like the parents actually look like parents back in 80s movies. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and you guys are a bad example because you look like sisters, but, but, uh, but, Thank but, you. but, <laughs> but, but I feel like in CW shows, the person cast as the father is two years older than the person cast as the daughter. Like, <laughs> like, wait, what? That's, that's the father of three kids he looks like a male model like and then i feel like back then back in the 80s films it was paul dooley and like you know all in 16 candles and older actors and like i feel like that's went away and 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 even the reality everybody feels like the parents are now keeping better shape and i feel like the the, where was that where'd that go and so i i would i would make the parents a little younger and i would make them more 
more, you know, not, not just, not just more engaged, like they weren't engaged. And so when that speech comes out of, when we say they're being treated like human beings because they are being treated like human beings, yeah. it does come out of nowhere, like uh, pulling down a screen with a bullet point presentation when I, when I wish it would be more casual and then, but we, we love each other, right? We, this is good, right? We're all good. We're all good. Like, you know, yeah. that, I think that's the way the parents talk is like when they get mad at their kid, they're like, okay, but this is good, right? We, we had a conversation, right? We had a breakthrough, right? Like, you know. <laughs> I think though that you, you know, how's your saying that you helped steer into the nineties with Heather's is that parenting really started changing because these, uh, at that time, like the, 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 um, young people who became parents around 1989, 1990 started parenting differently than they did in the eighties. So the eighties, they were, they were super detached. The nineties, they start to creep in and they start to be the, you can be anything you want to be. And like that sort of, it, it, it it's a it's a it's a fun and it's part of your program's thesis it's a funny thing is like that 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 something like well wait a minute i i was the teenager in an 80s movie i don't want to become the parent in an 80s movie so uh-huh. like i gotta i gotta redefine parenthood somehow mm-hmm. yeah um so let's talk about the um sexual assault dodgeball that we see <laughs> go throughout the whole film uh you know, it's not just one example or one kind that we see. I mean, Veronica is constantly assaulted, yeah. right? Yeah. Even by JD at some point, you know, of, of people trying, you know, guys trying to get in her pants, as they used to say, um, and her, her fending herself off. Um, and then Heather, which Heather was McNamara. it? Heather McNamara, which we do want to know about that last name. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, is this, is this the key to our obsession, a McNamara last name? <laughs> Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Cause but, I have a lot of Heathers who come up to me, but I've never had a, a McNamara, a McNamara come, up, come at you. Her. Yeah. Um, well, and, uh, what do you got against McNamara? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Well, so now we have to find out where did the last name McNamara come from? You don't know. You've never read, you've never no. read any. It's, it's, it's actually kind of, a, I'm sure Riley may find the answer boring, but there, there was a, a um, for, for you older viewers out there, Is listeners go out there. It is going back to <laughs> Vietnam where, where like I happen to be reading um, the best and the brightest uh, David Halberstam book about how we got into Vietnam. And it was uh, kind of um, Kennedy had his coven of advisors and one of them was Robert McNamara. And I wanted like, like, and I always loved that the, the Veronica and the Heathers were this secret coven that ran the school. So, so like, and I always compared her to the, there's a Nazi Albert Speer who was the great Nazi. He was a very nice guy, great architecture architect. And like, I always thought Veronica is Albert Speer and like she, she's the good Nazi. And Robert McNamara is just one of the, one of the bad guys. I mean, he's actually a very smart man, but there's a documentary about him, the fog of war. Now we're really going down a portal. <laughs> but, but so I just, and I, and and the, you know, and it was also just like, when you're typing your first script and it's it's it has three characters named Heather's, three three characters named Heather, you want to really make the three last names really different. So just on the page, I had Chandler and I was obsessed with Patty Duke, so I liked Heather Duke, and then McNamara was just like what a what a what a juicy name. Mm-hmm. So it's like I, I that's that's where Heather McNamara came from. Well, I'm going to make business cards and put Tara McNamara. What a juicy name. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Heather Chandler is Kim Walker. Yeah, I know. That was my maiden name. So, yeah. I'm, oh, really? I'm oh, just all over this. Yeah. Oh Walker McNamara is to be on. Oh, nice. So, so, together. so we'll go back now to oh, the... Go back to sexual harassment. No, sex, sexual assault, back. dodgeball. Um, so, but I, I do think that that's interesting. And I'm curious, you, male writer, you know, why, why did you incorporate that so many times in so many different ways? Like... Well, yeah, and I mean, and unfortunately, it goes back to guys in high school that they are not very fascinating. I don't want to make a movie about guys in high school because um, they suck. Because <laughs> they suck, yes. Um, but but and it, but and it also fascinated me that the women have these interesting dramas going on, but then they then they have these boyfriends that are just not worthy of them. May, maybe this is the the 
the the nerd the nerd writer talking like I was like why did they go out with these guys and then and then the more I found out from my sister and other women I knew that and there and I found out things from the the most beautiful girl in our high school like who I thought was this Audrey Hepburn princess and it turned out like she ended up like like just having th- horrible sexual things with like s- these older guys. And like, it was just, it just, it it was just, you know, I mean, the, the reality of it is not, not even fun. And, and like, it, and again, again, good, Dan, good Dan waters would have taken a jeweler's loop and like, I am going to make a movie exposing the sexual harassment and the thuggish behavior of males. But to me, it was almost more chilling of just taking that for granted and making it just putting it inside the fabric of the the movie and like have it something in the background, like 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 you like you said, there's a you know a, a day rape that nobody involved, neither he, neither Ram or Heather McNamara probably thinks it's a date rape. They just think it's like. Oh God, this is guys like this is what we get for you know n- not not calling it an evening too quickly, and that that's like flopping around in the background while j d and Veronica have this conversation, mm-hmm. so it's like to me, it made it that much more ugly if it's just part of the fabric. It's just not like I'm not even examining it, I'm not even stopping the stopping the movie to say, "Look at this terrible behavior, of course, then when we kill Kurt and Ram nobody's feeling bad about it. It's part of the mm-hmm. reason, like, you know, and again, going back to my, one of my second favorite lines of the movie it, is the, um, you know, they had nothing off through school, but date rapes and AIDS jokes, mm-hmm. like, which again, like you could do a whole movie about date rapes and AIDS jokes. And, but it's just a throwaway line. Like we are hitting the ground running. We are not going to stop for anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I just thought that everything with it is so truthful from um, Heather Chandler, you know, her boyfriend makes the comment or the college boyfriend makes a comment. Oh, I just can't control myself. So she's like, okay, well, I guess I better do this. This is going to be the better option for me than to, to give him oral sex than getting raped, which is probably what's going to happen. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, and another movie wouldn't have included her spitting and spitting Mm -hmm. in the mirror. They would have kept her just like, okay, she's just the mean girl. Like, you know, right. But why would she make, try and make Veronica also go through that? Because she got mad at her for not, yeah, no, because guy. because why should she? Why should Veronica get away without doing sure. it? Why? Why? You know, at least if she's with me, then I'll feel better about myself and just think that this is the karma of all of us. Yeah, that, that you know the the Brett Kavanaugh allegations um, about the girl who would be they would be drunk and then there would be a line outside the door and you know of guys who are going to go rape her and the, there were women at the party you know <laughs> like and these it sounds like they were regular occurrences yeah, and, yeah. And, and so and also to be able to call somebody else a whore and you not be called a whore that that's 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 gold yeah which you yeah. you get when they're making yeah. fun of oh i heard what you did last night no matter what veronica yeah, says. I, tr- I tried I, I think in the original scott i had more of a speech for her she has that speech g blank i had a nice time and which somebody just quoted back to me and i'm like i was so touched like oh I had to give him the G blank speech, like, "Oh, people actually use that. That's great." <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, there's a there's a scene in Mean Girls that got cut out of the movie that's actually on the DVD. Quoting my brother, damn it, and Tina Fey. Um, <laughs> but there, where Lacey Chabert is in the mirror and just like, "Tonight, I'm finally going to have sex." And and then one of the other girls say, "But you've had sex before, but this time I'm going to enjoy it," <laughs> which I thought was great. And also, there's another very influential book to me, and it's going to I'm going to blow your mind when I tell you what it's called. Um, it's the book that Fast Times at Ridgemont High is based on. Mm-hmm. With that which camera, is hard, which is like impossible to get Cameron now. Crow, which I probably shouldn't have thrown away in my cup. It's, and I've told Cameron Crow this too. It's, I mean, it is such a darker more chilling book than than the movie. Like I like the movie, but when I when the movie's coming out, I thought it was gonna be the godfather of teen films is like because it had so the book had so much stuff. And there's a and there's a scene that was very influential to me where the character that Phoebe Cates ends up playing in the movie, um she I think she even in the movie talks about she has this b- boyfriend that's away. Yeah. And, and, and an older boyfriend. Because that was the appeal in the 80s. If you're a teenager, if you dated an older guy who was 
graduated, you know, he was in college. You were so cool. Yeah. Which yeah. is what led to lots of sexual assault. Yeah, but, that's perverted. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, then, and there's a chapter in there's a chapter in the book where she goes, Okay, uh, there's a nice guy who's in senior class, like, you know, I'm just gonna go out with him. Yeah. And and the book, just no amusement whatsoever. It just takes them through the day where they go to a fast food restaurant and he makes he makes has fun with somebody in the back and then but then he just drives her to the top of the hill and pushes her head down Mm -hmm. and that's the end of the chapter and like just no no comment no frills to it and i was just like it was so just gut-wrenching like jesus yeah that's what constitutes a date and so like i I always remembered that it's like amy heckerling didn't um film the scene but so i kind of like in many ways stole that scene for others Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i know they they changed made made her change some of the sex scenes in fast times as well which probably changed again minds yeah well the sex scenes in fast times and original mile high those are very well done yeah very realistic but i think that i think that the original one where she has sex with the older guy when she sneaks out of the house when stacy sneaks out of the house is um originally filmed to be more awful for her you know <laughs> just more like less enjoyable which yeah. is also a hallmark of 80s teen sex is yes. like no it's just about the guy and i'm always uh, fascinated by these old films that you see where guys would say oh she laid there like a cold fish and i'm just thinking how did yeah. no how was that they, enjoyable yeah it's, it's like, like because whose your fault fe- was that your foreplay game was so good like, I, <laughs> there's a reason i mean you, like you bought a whole pizza i mean come on <laughs> It's super weird now because uh, I think I I was thinking about it and now I'm like, girls honestly are not hurt by the term whore or slut anymore. They're the girls that are hurt are usually the ones who have been sexually assaulted and then called a whore for it. And you're mm-hmm. like, bro. But girls now, I think since rape, since rape is like now like a huge thing. Yeah, we're um, all aware and aware that it's wrong. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> so finally now being heard and listened to. So yeah. now girls are like, I can be a whore, but it's the boys' fault if they come on to me, which is true. It is their fault. But now girls are like exploiting their whoreness, and it's kind <laughs> of like it, horniness, it's right. kind of like I feel like it's to get back at guys like because it's like here here's my entire body that you can see but you can't touch it like you know like social media like works like that yeah that's that's a whole did you see what your harness that's a whole new game did you see the girl so there's in the 80s mothers would have said you know you're you're playing with fire you're and other people said you were asking for it exactly but now it's like no it's the guy who's like a rapist (laughs) but (laughs) but um just like a quick side note, there was a girl. So you know the Australian fires right now. Yes. There's a girl on Twitter who posted a thing and it says, "If you donate ten dollars to the wildfires in Australia, I will send you my nudes." And so she put it on Twitter, and it got like two two hundred thousand retweets or whatever. She tweets again, and she says, "My family disowned me. All my accounts got deleted." Can't find a job, but fuck it, <laughs> save the koalas. Uh-huh. Like, like she's like girls are exploiting it because we like w- us girls have uh, like more. We have well, so much more power than we like give ourselves with sex. We can control men, control them. All you just have to do is like put a little cleavage out, and all that's that's it. Like that's it. Yes, but that's a dangerous power, and and it is a and, dangerous and, and, power. But it also makes us weak in a way because and some men would, and men kind of love the myth that oh, own it, girl, you you go, girl, more nu- more nudity. If that empowers you, then, then we're, we're, <laughs> let it happen. Oh, I would just also like to add that uh, the girl who did the ten dollars thing, she um, raised, I think. Um, a million dollars to ten million dollars a lot of money yeah okay yeah it was exactly that's what i'm saying that's like she she has so much power she needs a better agent i was gonna say it's free on the she could have done 50 i know it's hard to find boobs anymore that's the thing with guys though that's the thing (laughs) is it's like it's like you can just go search porn why are you asking me for naked pictures of me when you could literally just type in through four letters porn and like you don't even know. That's, it's, 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 it's it's strange for a man of my generation where we had to work with our mother's Cosmopolitan magazines. Oh, like, the, you know, and just 1978 we, we had, Cosmopolitan. We were geniuses back then. 
1978 Cosmopolitan in Heather Chandler's locker. Why is there a 1978 Cosmopolitan? Wow. I don't know. I, that <laughs> was, the first was thing. certainly not in the script. It must be 1978. Although, geez, that's probably that was probably the core core cosmopolitans I used back then instead of porn. No, 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 but I'm just saying because I, I, I've always wondered that. That's I thought funny. there was a, there had to be a specific reason. Just like you hear with the, the shiny yeah. Stanley Kubrick, right? Like Jack Nicholson when he's in the lobby he's looking at a specific issue of Playgirl magazine that is old and it is, and there's an article that's in there that can take you down a rabbit hole. Oh, that's uh, of funny. maybe what the secret meaning of the shining is. Wow, I I cannot. I wish because a lot of times we just take what's at, what whatever's there's a cosmo- around, but there's <laughs> there's not going to be a 1978 Cosmopolitan around. I have to I have to find out from the production design people about that. But <laughs> that's funny. Um. So okay. So you we 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 zoomed ahead. Let's go back really quick and just say so you wrote this screenplay and you're living with. With Larry, who I'm, I don't want to say his last name wrong. I'm always afraid I'm going to botch people's last names, so I'll let you say it. It's Karaszewski. <laughs> there you go. And um, and you is he like encouraging you? Is he chiming in? I mean, is this two writers? Like, is is I mean, I just I yeah. imagine you two stoned in a room oh. coming up with all of these. <laughs> That's what I imagine. Oh my god, I was I was such a late bloomer for everything, <laughs> everything good. Um, I was so sober. <laughs> Well, this is what I tried to tell her. People were not smoking pot, though, that were my oh, age, well, at least. And well, yeah, you and you true. can't appreciate how bad the pot was when we were smoking. At, at your <laughs> age. Like you, you, the quality of the pot you, you youngins have is so much better. Like, you know, we, we, we're advanced. Bro. It would take nine thousand joints to get to where one joint. <laughs> anyway, but that's a, that's another story for another podcast. But um, uh. Yeah, no, they were very. I mean, I was, I, and I still recommend this. I didn't tell anybody. Hey, I'm writing my dark satire teen teen films today. Like I'm going, like I didn't tell anybody really what I was writing, and I, which I believe is great because you're always getting unwanted criticism and unwanted examination when you tell people every day what you're writing. Oh, I came with a new scene, so it's kind of like I was the kooky hunchback like coming up with something like it so i definitely created a thing well geez it better be good he's been so weird and taking so long to write it but so i think people were grateful that it turned out good and so they were very everyone was very positive and you get the notes to scale it back so so you have the screenplay you find an agent through larry or i found an agent through larry the agent larry found me who um was kind of like Okay, this is a really twisted script. This will be our little secret. It shows you can write, but we shouldn't show this to anybody. So she put it in a drawer. And then um, the guy who ultimately directed the film was also at USC, Michael Lehman. He gave it to his agent, and his agent was like, what are you talking about? This We should be shouting this script from the rooftop. So she gave it to everyone in town, and it really caused a splash. No one wanted to make it. So it was, it's, it's still almost an accident that the movie actually got made but it was like people could tell that i could write that it was like oh this script's never going to be made in a movie but wow this guy's really got a great mind so come and do our like i got offered the parent trap part three that's the level things like, <laughs> so it's like make your crazy sensibility and put it in this so so it was almost like a miracle that the movie actually happened and was it i thought i read somewhere that it, it was because of home video that they said yes? Well, th- that's the thing. You can't appreciate now because now I feel like every movie that comes out, you know well in advance. It's playing here. It's playing here. It's about a superhero or it's about a monster or it's about – and there were so many other mo- accidental movies back then where there was these small studios that weren't like low-budget Sundance, my we're going to lose the farm kind of movies, but and, and we have a bad relationship in our backyard, um, but – and not – big budget like superhero movies but kind of a middle ground where all these weird stuff was happening of like you know movies that were cost like you know under 10 million dollars but above three million dollars where like you know movies like blue velvet and things like that were made in this scale this middle scale that doesn't exist anymore so for discovery at blockbuster yeah yeah and it, it was because they could be they can make their money back by selling it to video mm-hmm. they could that that doesn't no longer exist they don't have that free money because you got a lot you got so many movies made sometimes some of them wouldn't even be released in the theaters but um 
yeah, vid- but now you have a million streaming services. Yeah, yeah. Well, now it's a yeah, now it's its whole different. Now it's another different thing where, which but but you know, you know, to me, I'm an old fogey. You can't beat the experience of seeing it for the first time in a theater, even though Heather's was mostly seen on video cassette. And I, I hate. I hate the poster of Heather's. I hate that artwork. It drives me nuts. It's so horrible. In front of the chalkboard? Yeah, in front of the chalkboard. It's just so lame and dainty and candy and like Romeo but 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 then but then I've I've learned to shut up waters like that video cover is what allowed people to rent it at video stores. Like people, the people at the video store wouldn't even check the rating. They're like, "Oh, look at this goofy piece of shit." Because there's uh, another one where yeah. it's like a dead girl, right? Yeah. Well, now now they're starting to get a little darker, but yeah. But the first one when people rented it was like, "Ooh, look at this cute little." Oh, you go home and watch your My Little Pony movie, and like, and, and so it was. It kind of got a lot of people and infected the brains that people people rented it. Like they didn't even know it was going to be. So it infected their brains. Is the best way. Like, I mean, like my brother, Mean Girls, he wants, he does test screenings. He wants everybody to have a good time. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, it's much better if there's a couple, it's not fun if everybody's laughing. Like, it's much better. (laughs) It's it's much better if, like, you know, because, you know, if you got a good 25, 30% of people who hate it, then it makes the other percent like it even more. Like, I mean, I always bring up the tale. My My favorite viewing experience is, um, a couple came out to me and said they used to go out with other people. They went on a double date. They saw Heather's at a repertory theater. Their boyfriend and her, her and, and his girlfriend, they started talking about how much they hated the movie and how awful Heather's is. And then they got, they just broke up with them right then and started yeah. going out. The, the Heather's lovers started going out with each other. So if I can if I can break up some couples like and bring Heather's lovers together, that's the best. Yeah. Um. Quick question. Why croquet? <laughs> you, you, boy, you know, how much better is croquet than Twitter, though? Like, you know, I mean, <laughs> I got, I got lucky that I, that I made this before the explosion. I mean, um, yeah, croquet was certainly not a thing we did in the 80s. It was not a thing for 80s teen film. I like how people come up to me and say, so croquet was big in the 80s, right? Like, no, not really. <laughs> Kurt Cobain did not kill croquet. Um, yeah, it was, but it was like, it, it's a game that has meanness in it. It mm-hmm. has gamesmanship and cruelty. It's also got like an aristocratic flavor. Like it is something that you can see the the upper sanctum doing together. And so it's kind of like, and you, and you can talk. You can, it's not basketball. It's not badminton. It's mm-hmm. like you can talk and plot and scheme and, and you know when she has to when she hangs out with her old friend Betty Finn, um, she's eventually got to knock her out because she's a loser and she's a winner and that's the way it is. Like mm. so, it's a, it's a it's a certain cruelty to the game that I thought was perfect. So yeah, but Betty admits that she's like, why why wouldn't you hit me out? She's yes. like, just hit me out, just win. So it's called good writing. <laughs> <laughs> so as you're making the the film, you, I mean, I I've, these are things I've read. I don't necessarily want you to repeat what you said i but i you um but you get notes you people are asking you to scale back some parts you have actresses whose parents don't allow them to take the roles but you're very young and i think there is something to being young uh especially before you have kids where you're just like no what's wrong with all of you you know well again it goes back to naivete like i i i don't think i'm offending people i'm just doing something fresh and but then but again it also goes back to like hey it must be working if somebody doesn't like it, and you know, if, very and, strategic thinking. Yeah, and and the the casting process. Uh, yes, we definitely had some actors' parents that wouldn't let them do it, and they were under eighteen, so it was mm-hmm. like pro- probably best that they don't do it. And but you know, Winona's parents loved it. Like you know, that's all we needed. Like I mean, um, I mean, it's a great. I think it's the great. The 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 actors find the movie. Like I mean, I don't want anybody in here who's going to regret it. Like mm-hmm. you know. Shannon did famously at the cast and crew screen and come out and say, nobody told me it was a comedy. Like, you know, but, <laughs> but if that helped her performance, that's great. Right. That's great. Like, and, and, you know, and I can't thank the actors enough because I think they definitely elevated the material. I think my, my script was a little darker and more heartless. And then but when you put one owner writer in it, suddenly she, and Veronica is doing some pretty sketchy things, but when we're not writers doing it, it's like you're right along with her, so it it it, it definitely helped. So, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, but I yeah I had no problem with being the bad boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and it was again mostly the ending that mm-hmm. people like you know they were like even this, the people who made the movie were pretty cool, but they were all along the ride for the ending. I think you got something with the ending wrong that JD didn't blow up the school at the end of the right, script. right, it right. Was it was Veronica kills JD, right, and then she stands in front of the bomb, and she's like, hmm. Maybe this is a good idea. And she just lets the bomb click off the last 10 seconds and then blows up. Mm-hmm. And then there's another ending, the ending that we ended up being the shooting script, where um, she kills JD and she walks alone away from the pep rally, away from the school. She's narrating. And then she turns around and she's wearing she's wearing the bomb. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And then we fade to black and you just hear her go boom. Mm. And so that was another fun ending. <laughs> But yeah, and yeah, it's like I was a, I kind of like you can't believe they make me do this happy ending. Uh-huh. So it's like, but there's I like to think there's a certain irony to the happy ending and a certain um, and but you know, like I talked to the guys who did the musical and like if the movie didn't have a happy ending, they would have never thought of doing a musical about it. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I love the love the musical. It's given me permission to love Heather's and love myself, and it's great. And when I do drink at night and, and you know, look up Dan Waters, why hasn't he written more good movies and <laughs> is he still relevant? Like I, I love coming across like high school productions of the musical because they are putting their hearts into it. And it's so even, – even when they're not good, they're heartbreaking. Even, yeah. even and- when the JDs are of dubious sexuality, it still blows my – makes me cry. And so it's like I, I did – I do – I do, I do love the musical. So if if the happy ending was enough to get the musical, that's good enough for me. Did you? So you were listening to the stories of your um, younger siblings to kind of stay in that high school mode. Was there any other research that you went back to do? Because I mean, you graduated high school in when nineteen eighty. We're the ones that can get it done. We're the class of eighty one. Okay, um, <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's changed a lot. I mean, the thing is, the thing, yeah, the thing is, I didn't do a lot of research. I did interview my sister with clunky questions, and like she, she did. I mean, she was the forger for this high school. Like she did come up. That that whole note thing is pure Stephanie Craft. If she's listening, nice. Um, but uh, that is so. I and I wonder because I was like, that's so specific, and I thought it was just a device to. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's the best one. When you come up with something like. Oh my God! I can use this to forge a suicide note. It's like, but no, my sister was the the handwriting forger, evil evil succubus that she is. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so and then, so because the movie is is almost as much about uh, cultural um, depictions of high school mm-hmm. than high school itself. Like I said, I'm not making a documentary here. I'm making, I'm making like taking what I know about the real high school experience. In general, what pop culture is treating the high school experience like, and and not doing one, th- do, not doing a documentary, but doing a way that plays off both of them. Like when you think I'm going to do something documentary like about high school, I do something crazy. When I think I'm going to do something crazy, I do something real. Like I think mixing it up is is, is what keeps people lose. Keep bringing up the word jarring, but like I, it keeps people off their toes. Like. Well, you know, all the side characters, supporting characters, the, I mean, you know, when you talk about why it's still so relevant is because it depicts high school as it still is, right? The groups, but even, you know, the stoner, the, the, you know, the, the, the middle, the kids who aren't the most popular and aren't the least popular, they're somewhere in the middle, the high school newspaper editor, you know, these are all archetypes that exist. Yeah, it is. I mean, I had those basic, it is funny. Like even mean girls had, uh, mean, (laughs) mean Asian girls, like, you know, that, 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 uh, like, I like that there's a new group every time, like even jawbreaker, did new groups and like you know that that you know that we're going to keep adding the group, but we you still got your basic food groups of jocks and stoners and, mm-hmm. and the top popular girls. Well, what now? It's honestly, I mean, personally, I was never a groupie. I can't do <laughs> clicks. Like people get tired of me way too easy, <laughs> so I have to You're roam. A floater. Yeah, yeah, I'm a floater. <laughs> 
But I think that a lot of people, no one's a floater, but I think that groups are colliding. I, yeah. Because there's, there's things that, like, I mean, I don't want to be, put the bad part on, but if you're, if you're popular and you're friends with the stoners, you get the best weed. You know what I mean? If you're, yes. if you're a stoner and you're friends with popular kids, you get invited to parties. Like, and even, like, the nerds, like, it, no one cares. The popular kids are really smart, too. Like, they'll, you know, collaborate. Well, yeah, that was a great thing in Booksmart where uh, everybody's kind of smart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah, no, I have I have um, two, two nie- three nieces in high school and one niece about to go into high school. And so I, I have kept up a little bit and it has become much more amorphous that there is a lot of bleeding between cliques. And like c- and part of the reason is we've they've seen these movies like – that 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 the, and they have much. I mean, I'm not talking for you, Riley, but the, there seems to be much more demarcation of like those are the movies, and then now we're going back to real life, and like so that that you can make fun of the movie. But so you're you're conscious when somebody's behaving like something in a movie. Like, wait a minute, that's from that movie. Like mm-hmm. when when we were fight, fighting for ourselves back when I was in high school. It's so weird because, uh, like I said, my first high school that I hated hate 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 they're super super clicky like and i was still a roamer but they would like think i'm weird for being a roamer yeah. right where's your passport <laughs> <laughs> but um what's what was weird is that don't want to be mean but the cheerleaders were actually the annoying fat chicks that no one liked well, <laughs> and the I... football players were all the guys that were honestly really weak and just needed a sport like you know she it was went to a, it yeah. was a very academic high school it's, I said, it's an yeah. ivy get into ivy league school yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> even in, even in the late 80s cheerleaders were not the popular ones like and so when i made heather mcnamara popular i do have some lines of heather chandler like kind of making fun of her for being a cheerleader mm-hmm. and like and only the principal thinks it's cool to be a cheerleader like already then it was a little low rent but it was like you almost like you need the visual of somebody somebody's got to be wearing a cheerleader outfit in high school film so right well they yeah. uh the the college guy that with veronica said he was like oh there's my little cheerleader oh yeah 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 even the east traffic in the cliches yeah Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, for him, it's a token get, then, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm sure he told everybody in school that he, man, she's a cheerleader, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, so as you're going, you have this, you basically, you've created a revenge fantasy film. And it's a vigilante film, which also was popular in the 80s. Yeah, you, you've gotten better with your vigilante pronunciation. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. You were giving it a very mid-Atlantic vigilante <laughs> The last, the last, the last All right, fine. So, so listen, I have the vigilante with a You side can't of. make fun of people who are readers. Okay? <laughs> it means that they figured out how to pronounce that have already. Oh yeah, I'm not believe me. I just, found, <laughs> I just found out recently, impotent and impotent are the same thing. <laughs> What do you mean there's no word called impotent? <laughs> you always thought impotent meant, yeah, uh, yeah important. You know. in, an, in an improv show, I accidentally – it actually made it funnier, but I, instead of uh, Versace, I said Versace. I just straight up didn't know that was Versace. <laughs> oh, oh, that's great. <laughs> You're like, that's it's because I'm a reader. Hello. No. <laughs> But anyway, so you so you've made a vigilante film. So I have to. You've heard the previous podcast, so you know where I'm going. I have to ask you. So when Columbine happens, are you like, oh shit? I yeah. I, boy, this is where I'm, I, I'm getting. I should. I was afraid. You, I, I know. I, 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 and it's no, cringy no, for no, me no, to no, ask. No, but no, <laughs> no, no. But I mean, part of me was like, operator, is my phone working? Like, where, where's where are my phone calls? Like. And I was like, and I'm like you, like basketball diaries. Don't give me the basketball diaries. <laughs> it ain't the basketball diaries. Like I, th- I thought, you know, Heather deserved a little more credit. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, like geez, where's where's my where's my where's my school shooting residuals? Like, you know, oh God! It's like, geez, what, what what's the guy got to do? <laughs> well, not get the TV series, uh, you know, renewed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing now. The, TV series gets punished, but um, uh, yeah, I'd like to think, I'd like to think he- he- to actually do that based on Heather's would be a mis- like it, there's a certain catharsis to Heather's that like, geez, you shouldn't have to do school shooting, but but the thing is, absolutely, when I wrote it, like I thought, hey, this is funny. I'm going to put this isn't about teen suicide; it's about murder because murder wasn't on the Cheesecake Factory menu back then, right? Like, you know, right, and, and now I feel like. The menu's gotten huge now. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, the the problem is. And you're like, oh, I was the first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The problem is, like, you think every, everything was weird, but but the internet has made nothing. It is de weirded everything. Uh-huh. Like, there's something for everyone on the internet. So it's just like you can come anything you can come up has a chat group. Like anything you come up has a site. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's 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 tough. But, but but I mean, again, I'm being horrible again. But you know, I, school shootings. Like I'm like. Why? Why aren't there more? Like you know that 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 is my attitude of like you know it, I think it's amazing how many school shootings don't happen. Mm-hmm. True. Like that, that that. By the way, because it's so it's so in people's minds and like, and it's sounds so much more exciting than killing yourself. So like I don't know why it does that. So, <laughs> so so it it does like you know it is it is a fascinating thing. Um. Well, my old the first high school I went to, they uh. We had so many bomb threats, like where we had to leave school because people would call in and yeah. bomb threat or say that there was a shooter. Or sometimes there was like say, people would say there was a shooter and we get locked in our classes like all the time. But most of the and time. why do they all have anxiety? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there was uh, – none of them ever happened. The first time it happened though, they put all of us in one place. Oh, it was a school shooting, and they put a, all of us on the field, and we all were, like, running out, like, ditching oh class. Gosh. It was crazy. Wow. But um, but th- I only knew – there was – the only people I knew that got caught were these two, like, weirdos who threatened it because they didn't want to take a test. So I don't – like, <laughs> I don't I understand. This might be the sequel to Heather's. Is and they got arrested. It, because also um, there's a nearby high school where your friend – William went and they, he was friends with these, this girl who did, who they, they stopped it beforehand, but she, I guess had put some, she wrote like on the girl's bathroom, like saying like, Oh, tomorrow you will all die. Like something like super well, the thing, weird. The, the but weird, hold on though. But yeah. she was celebrated for it. That's she, the thing. Well, She was, well, they tried him. Th- he and the, his other best friend were best friends with her and they were like a little group. And so then after that happened, um, his other best friend, the other girl, got called in. And the girl that did it blamed her best friend for it. So then Nick, my friend Nikki was getting all of, like, the blame, and her and William were going in and being like, this is not true. It had to be her. She was the only person that went in the bathroom. Like, what? And, like... Well, once they, but once they found out, then they everybody thought, oh, everyone will turn on this. She left for... She, like, went to Mexico for a week. Yeah. Right? But then when she came back, it turned out that a lot of kids in the school were like... Hey, you know, congratulate, like good, really? good for you. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, uh, this is turning in oh a way no. that I didn't. Well, anticipate. yeah, they had they had the cops like come too, and there was like a whole like case for it. And then she just randomly went to Mexico, <laughs> and then she came back, and nothing happened. Like absolutely oh, that's, nothing that's happened. Weird. I and, mean, we get because we used to have crazy stuff like that too. People threats and writing, but there was there was not a culture to back it up. So now everybody's it's everything causes much more anxiety. Like when I was going to uh, school, it was like every day was like, oh today's the race riot. There's gonna be a huge race riot. Like and you know, and then we just like, oh, okay. Like, you know, but but then but we had because we we never actually thought anything would actually happen. But mm-hmm. now but now you have to think it might happen. Right. Well, yeah, you, you everything's really don't... possible. Now. Right. Right. Especially even if like like if someone doesn't have a gun, you can just 3D print it. Like it's it's not hard anymore. And that's the thing with like the gun laws thing is I don't yeah. want guns. I think it's kind of dumb for everyone to have one. But even if we get rid of them, make them illegal, people can still make them because we have all of the materials and all of the instructions and we can 3D print them or we can just make them out of metal. Like, yeah, yeah. anything can happen now because we have so much technology and advancement. So is that a word? But yeah, no, I feel I actually saw I actually I actually ended up liking the Heather's TV series that mm-hmm. that uh, like I got a bad I thought the ep- first ep- couple episodes were a little weird, a little silly, but it ended up being quite interesting. And they had a they had like a you know school shooting practice session that I thought, geez, if I was writing sat- high school satire, I, w- I would this is good stuff. But like nobody's it's not as funny anymore for it, the the. The seventy thirty split has now become 
the other way where only 30% are going to find that funny and the other 70% are, it's not funny anymore, guys. Cringing hard. Yeah. I mean, that's how I felt the whole time watching The Joker as I was just cringing the whole time because you're just like, listen, in 1989, great film right now pretty irresponsible yeah so. it, but it is interesting watching watching the musical with audiences is like and the musical does a lot to lighten things up but still there's this core now that has a different unsettling feeling that didn't that the movie didn't have because it it, it does because you're having actual young people perform the music and actual young people in the audience but it's you know as an artist it's still interesting but it is it, it and so i'm like well this is this is playing better than ever now but but it it is a bizarre alchemy of like you know what 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 eight, what 1989 was was still acceptable as satire is now you got to play it as more than satire the music plays it not just direct satire plays it as this really expansive experience so but it is interesting how it has an and if it has a different. I love I love stories that have a different effect on each member of the audience. Like mm-hmm. I feel like a a great superhero movie is going to have the same effect on everyone. But Heather's still in 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 any incarnation. When you see it now, it affects everybody a different way, which is which is cool. But unfortunately, it's cool at the expense of a very fucked up culture. Right. So if you so I'm sure sequel i mean you've you've people have asked you would you ever would there be veronica now as a parent i mean yeah, you know, or, yeah is that or, the school, or the school principal yeah i mean you know yeah i mean there's um i you know i mean let's face it you know i'm lucky to have like pe- pe- people used to say why haven't you done anything as good as heather's now they tell me hey at least you did Heather's like at least you know, <laughs> like you're, you know, how many writers out there have done something that still has an effect on people and, mm-hmm. st- and still relevant, still relevant. And I'm like, why would I mess that up? Like, at least I got this one jewel, like, you know, my career, but, has now's the, and downs, but, but like, now's but, the but, time. But, but, but no, nothing, nothing hurts a movie than a bad sequel. I think like it just suddenly, oh, you have no self-confidence. Like, like, you know, <laughs> No, I mean, even if I did a great, I, I just don't want to. Yeah, no. I mean, if it goes the way of Terminator, <laughs> I mean, but then there's well, some. I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. The ter- Terminator's got like 90, 90 of them, and then like, and how great, and even the the first Matrix is so good. Like, but we don't talk about the we talk about the whole Matrix thing now with a little cynicism, like because there's been there's four more coming, and like there was well, there's a Mean Girls too. Let's see. Right. right, there's different. Well, that, that that's <laughs> even beneath our contempt. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, occasionally, I I just don't. I you know. Well, what do you? I, think? I'm, Where I'm, would I'm, she be? What would have? I mean, she has to be so traumatized. Well, I... <laughs> well, well, Riley, you got to help me out. What would what would the what would the new name be? Because there there was a good there was a good in the early early century there was a good Ashley run that Ashley's would have been great but I feel like Ashley's gone and Riley and, and, Riley has now become a popular name Riley by the way name of my high school really yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. awkward <laughs> Riley's there you go <laughs> oh Riley <laughs> I, I might be wrong but wasn't the original ending they all die and go to prom and well yeah so after 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 yeah. The, yeah after the explosion yeah there was and the punch bowls filled with the blue liquid mm-hmm. the hall cleaner and I just remember <laughs> Yes, it was "Simple Minds Alive and Kicking" was going to be the closing theme song because I always thought that was a good song. <laughs> Did you pick "Kesara Sara"? Um, that's a Larry Kierzuski thing. Okay. Larry Kierzuski, um used to play that old Sly Stone version of the song, and 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 he said, "Hey, this would be a cool ending for Heather's." Like, and I go, "Not really." And I go, eh, "Maybe." I and, but then we thought, "Oh, if we did." the the cheery light version of Kesarat Sarat at the start. Mm-hmm. So Karazuski gets credit for that. Oh nice. Nice. Um one last question for you, and that is so you know, usually the director winds up getting th- the credit for the film. And in this case, you know, your as, name... as well he deserves credit. Well no, but I've... oh okay. But yeah, I know what you're going at. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because it, it it is very funny that you know, here I am, a first-time screenwriter, and you read all the books. Don't even William Goldman's book. All the screenwriting books, they say you're going to do all this work, and you'll 
don't worry, just accept now. You'll never get credit. No one will never know your name. And like that's just the way it is for a screenwriter. So be tough. And they, it was pretty crazy. They mentioned the screenwriter. And to this day, they they mention mention the writer. So I was like, I'm like, hey, that's the way it is, baby. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's. Yeah, I mean, obviously the dialogue calls attention to itself, but I liked even the people who hated the movie, Blame Me, which I, I took as a badge of honor. Okay. I still remember some of the negative reviews. Waters' dialogue is so arch, they could build a second high school on top of it. <laughs> like, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Also, message to young writers out there, always think of the Halloween costume when you're writing. Smart. Because, like, you know, that gives you – immortality because the heathers heathers has been given bringing it to halloween for a long time i think it's when you when you when you write something like that and the, you know i wrote batman returns so the catwoman costume batman returns is is no joke either so just think something to think ahead well also tying into a holiday gary marshall figured that out there uh toward the end but if you tie it into a holiday every year it's going to get played. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yes. Valentine's Day. Well, New Year's. well, Batman <laughs> Returns is, is apparently a big Christmas movie now, which I didn't know at the time was going to be. So yeah. it was Die Hard. Well, yeah, right. Since it came, yeah. Both movies came out in the summer. So, but now they're Christmas movies. Yeah. I should have had Heather's take place in Arbor Day, but um, I get some. <laughs> um, so any, any, what has nobody ever oh, asked no. you that I, you're like, why doesn't anyone ask me this? I, I, there can't be anything. <laughs> no, there's got, I just feel like there's, there's something too much in, in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. But, but if I knew what it was, I'd, I'd <laughs> like, I you're just not harboring a, I just want to make sure you're not harboring some secret that you thought someone has just not asked me the right question. I have a question. Okay. What does, what's the real definition of very? Really very. It's it's writer laziness. Okay. Because <laughs> it's like I didn't know so, if it was actual it, lingo. Because or... you know, I mean, it was like you know, I don't want to create slang that's already been in a John Hughes movie, so I got to create my own stuff and like I got to Shakespeare up this bitch and like I'm like, okay, what's a word for cool? Okay, very blank, very blank, very okay. It's gonna come to me. Very, just say it. I'm like, wait a minute, what if I just stop right there? And just stop it very and like make very make very the um the adjective or mm-hmm. not the adjective, the you know, the, the noun or well, I'm getting something wrong, but <laughs> but you know, make very an end, end in itself. So. so would it mean cool? Oh yeah. Well I mean it's very it's definitely very. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not less. Which mean girls rips off with fetch, right? Like they kind of have like their uh, I, I'm gonna, gonna give to I'm gonna Tina gets complete credit for Fetch was a great – that was a great thing. <laughs> that was a great thing. It's so funny just seeing like like old movies and them say, like using slang and you're kind of like, oh, what does that mean? But I realize I've said slang in front of you, in front of my friend's grandparents, and they're like, what does that mean? Oh, it's like, so great, I have though. no idea what you're talking about. Well, it's so funny. The word Brad has had such a long trajectory and journey because it used to be the – it used to be the lamest word in the world. Like, you know, it had a whole period of like, you can't say rad anymore. That's mm-hmm. so lame. And then, but now rad is kind of like, it's so, it's so retro that it's kind of cute now. Yeah. 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 It's, sick is like the new word. Yes. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> no, I the, the early days of sick were, were very funny. Like I, I would like go into a record store and I was like, oh, water, you got to get this so fucking sick. I'm like, Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's vomitous. <laughs> All right, I did tell you it was the last question, but yet I, I I did try to. Okay, never mind. No, go ahead. No, I did. I did write a pilot that did get picked up, but I had somebody trying to make Holocaust happen. <sighs> like, man, that's some Holocaust shit. <laughs> like, you know, I still think I'm going to use that somewhere. Where... Uh, there is a a Flowbots song, Handlebars. The one of the greatest songs ever made. <laughs> That's exactly. Uh, I'm what serious. I'm yeah. serious. Yeah, and I, I had I, Holocaust. <laughs> I had a scene where I had, I wrote a you know some of my I have continued to write some amazing subversive scripts they just don't get made into movies. Your Honor, um, but I did have where the where the the chilling psychopathic girl does that song a cappella in her mirror. But so I'm a big fan of that song. Okay, good, good. I'm glad that I referenced it. I feel so cool now. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, she was like, oh, your little brother loves the song. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I know. Like, I didn't even... I was, like, amazed. He's nine, and he's like, I love the song, and he's playing it all the time. Oh, no. See, I would Because <laughs> it's such an omen, antichrist song. Yeah. Um, so... I, the research before, you know, after the podcast, the first podcast before here was that we were right that Veronica is more complicit in the murders. Well, than- well you, you got to go back to the, especially the first draft mm-hmm. where, I mean, still the, the first murder happens kind of quasi by accident and like, but you're, you're right that in subconscious level, like, you know, and even for JD, JD's not like, I'm going to kill her. Like even JD is kind of half ass about right. it. Like, hey, why she's this? Like he's he's not being like the Jack Nicholson at that point. I'm the devil. Mm-hmm. Feed her. The, like he's kind of just fucking around too. So, but then when it happens, like, oh, oh, let's see how this goes. Yeah. And then, but but you know, as as the you got the hiccups, you could cherry slushy if you'd like. <laughs> oh my god, I hate that. No, I mean, it's it's gonna go away. But that's a whole other story. Okay. So, but in in the original in the original script. Like she ends up killing, she ends up becoming like Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. Yeah. She ends up like loving, like she kills Peter. There's a character, the yearbook editor, Pete Dawson, who's in the movie now, who's like her friend at the school newspaper. And like, but he ends up becoming like this big publicity seeking college asshole. And like, and, and they kill him. But she she's the one who kicks the radio into his hot tub. And like, it's just, you know, so, so she was. Much more of a bad girl. But then when, when you cast Winona and you have to cut the script 100 pages out, like, you know, these things fall by the wayside. And it makes the movie better. Yeah. In those 100 pages, did you have more deaths? Yes. Yeah. Like how many? Not – I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Like no more Heathers die, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it just does like, you know, them thinking about killing Heather Duke. But I think there was – I think there was might have been a teacher, but it was Pete, Pete Dawson was the biggest death. But the hippie teacher, yeah, but she because she gets her own credit, and the, I w- oh, I wondered if her role was bigger. Her I, role I, was, I can't her, think of her name at the time. Yeah, Paul, Doctor Pauline Fleming. Yes, yeah, her, yes. Her, her her role was her role was bigger, but now that I think about it, I don't think they did kill her. But uh huh, because she has my she has she has my favorite line in the movie is like whether to commit suicide or not is the most important decision to <laughs> make yeah. which is now more satirical than ever because you can actually feel like somebody would ask that question yeah. yeah yeah and by the way i think there's one black student and one black teacher right mr mosby <laughs> oh, oh yeah yeah no he's he's well he he's he's gone on to be a teacher and a butler and many things phil lewis the actor yeah um yeah yeah no yeah and you guys were talking about the extras the extras in that movie they they cracked me up is that because we got these movie stars in the foreground and then we got like these 38 year old guys in jeans who are the extras and like you know it's it's so funny and yet and yet the what i they're dressed like actual high school students. yes yeah. yes and that's what's so crazy well, is like they're so costumed the heathers which i get why but like yeah. you know and then and in the, the back and, i'm like these are real clothes and, <laughs> and wearing. they're and the heathers costumes were meant to be surreal from the get-go they were this was there's they were almost like croquet like you know mm-hmm. nobody actually wore that stuff i mean occasionally on special occasions but not the daily uniform. The huge shoulder pads. Like, there's shoulder pads, and then there's those shoulder pads. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you've been very generous with your time. A lot of this was just self-indulgent here at the end while we just, right. like, you know. Well, <laughs> hey, it's a conversation. But, that's, the po- that's the point of podcasts. Yes. It's a conversation. I'm treating to mineral waters, though, if, uh, you know. <laughs> well, this Slurpee has done its work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. And um, you can go to 80smovieguide.com for the uh, total Heather's behind the scenes information and also do the podcast 80s Movies, A Guide to What's Wrong with Your Parents. You can. And on social media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff at 80s Movie Guide. So thanks for listening. I'm Riley Roberts. I'm Tara McNamara. I'm Dan Waters. <laughs> <laughs> See ya.